Jay Motta here for Stretford Paddock, and this is a one-on-one -on -one interview with The Athletic's Laurie Whitwell, who covers all things Manchester United base. So make sure you go and check out his work on The Athletic. Laurie, thanks for joining us again. Anytime, Jay. How you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm good, mate. You've got a nice new haircut as well there that I'll bring up. I'll tell everyone about that. Um, fresh out the barbers. Fresh out the barbers. I envy her. It's been, uh, it's been a long time since I went in the barbers. Um, it's been a bit of a interesting week, shall we say, mate, with uh, the, everything that's gone on. If we can just go back a little bit to what seems like an eternity ago, even though it was only about three days, I think. Mm. Um, what did you make of it when you heard that this, the Super League idea that, that had been mooted was actually was being pushed forward as a, as a real, real proposal. Yeah, it, well, Sunday, you know, um, I mean, clearly when, I mean, I was, I was at home watching the Burnley game. Um, my colleague Carl Anker was there at Old Trafford and clearly you know, he, he was reporting back that there wasn't anybody there from United. So you sort of getting a sense of, okay, no one's shooting this down. And then the Sir Alex Ferguson quotes come out and he's obviously thinking this is a moment I need to make my voice heard. You know, 15 years, he's not really said anything against um, the, the United owners and this felt kind of pivotal particularly in hindsight and then Gary Neville is obviously on the uh, broadcast uh, the, the gantry and uh, yeah he unloads he, get, he goes in and I wondered watching it back um, you know there was a little bit of a pause at the start from Sky whether they, they should address it or not this was going on you know on, on social media and, and in news reports uh, and then clearly I think they, they decided yeah we need to tackle this head on and Gary Neville was uh, a very evocative figure, lots of passion and, and made some good points. I think really crystallised what a lot of fans were thinking. Were you surprised at how it was handled at all or how yeah. the announcement was made? Because just as a, as a fan, let alone, you know, and, and I'm just curious as to what you thought of as a journalist, but just as a fan, I thought this just seems so odd and so poorly thought out the way they've pushed this forward, the way they've announced it. It just seemed like a PR disaster. It's really curious, and we're still trying to figure out exactly why that was. Uh, I mean, somebody that I spoke to said that it was leaked, so it wasn't like they were prepared. Um, the PRs maybe came on late to try and rescue the situation rather than have a structured plan in place going into it. Um, the reasons for it leaking, is that because someone was trying to derail it, or is it something to do with the, where the money was coming from with, with JP Morgan? Was there a kind of financial imperative to doing it then? Um or the alternative view is they just they they just didn't care. They they didn't really think that you know they, they were willing to ride out the kind of bad publicity, the fan reaction, and thought this is our idea. We need to do it this weekend because the UEFA um, Congress and, and the fact that these new Champions League um, formatting was, was going to get voted through, which they had agreed to. Um, you know, Ed Woodward agreed to it on the Friday um, with Seferin, the UEFA president, and uh, so they had to push the button on this now because there was no time to to wait. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a load of different conspiracy theories going around, but I think the main thing is this incredible sense from anyone you speak to. Not even, you know, a man in the street could understand that this was a PR disaster, but people in, that float in these circles that understand what it takes to, you know, enact change like this, and, and know the people involved, they were just amazed that, that it was two days of, of silence. Basically, you had Florentino Perez go on some, you know, re Spanish radio station. It was a bit tacky, to be fair, and. And that's the only guy that, that was willing to stand up, and he's still standing up. And, he, and now he looks like a, you know a, a, an island, doesn't he, on his own? Yeah. But you know, I suppose at least he, he had the courage of his convictions to go out and front it up. You know, uh, JW Henry's come out and done a kind of video um, apology. Joel Glaze has written a, a letter, um, you know, as, a, as an apology, which feels you know very much the, the absolute minimum. Um, and you know, whether or not that actually comes to pass we will see in terms of communicating with fans um, but yeah they, they lost the PR war the fans were all against it and it, it became very visceral didn't it? I mean the Chelsea fans going to Stamford Bridge was, was a real moment and I think also Man City and Chelsea I, I mean I think their hearts were in it for sure I think they were interested by it but when you've got a case of the British government coming down hard and Boris Johnson saying he's going to legislate against it whether or not he would have done whether or not he had the power to do so didn't really matter because I think you know, Abu Dhabi didn't want to get into a political situation with the British government over something like this. It's not not worth their while. So I think they were the first ones to, um, you know, decide actually let's let's step away from this. Chelsea certainly were were, were, were early as well, uh, and then the rest. You know, how can you have a Super League when you've not got Man City and Chelsea and and, and I mean to be honest, Bayern Munich and PSG as well. Yeah, it seemed doomed to failure from the start. Um, there's a lot of sort of rumours and stories going around that United were one of the sort of the leaders of this, that they were pushing this forward. You mentioned City and Chelsea there, that they were almost, like you say, went along with it because they felt they might be left behind. Is that your understanding of it? Were United one of the at the forefront of this? 
Yeah, I think so. I, I think from speaking to people that understand the situation, um, yeah, Joel Glazer's made no secret of the fact that he's wanted to have a bigger share of, of where the commercial revenue comes from in terms of uh, the European scale, sorry, the, the broadcast revenue rather. Um, you know, he and, and he comes from an American system where it's closed, you know, the NFL, um, their team, there's no relegation. So why not have that in Europe? You know, likewise, Liverpool. I think they were the two that were kind of really driving this. Um, and listen, United have got the clout, haven't they? They're you know, one of the biggest clubs in the world. Um, Florentino Perez was certainly one of the main architects of it. And, and he, you know, equally thinks that Real Madrid should have a larger share of um, the uh, money coming in from broadcast revenues in terms of Champions League and, and European football. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think Joel Glazer was right behind this. And he speaks to Ed Woodward every day. So I know that there's, um, you know, th- there has been some suggestions that Woodward resigned because of his uh, uncertainty over the Super League and the way it was handled. Maybe there was an element of that, you know, after it had, after he realised it was a, a horrendous error. But I would be amazed, and speaking to people that have known him in meetings with the Premier League, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that he wasn't well aware of this, what was coming. You know, he knows um, Joel Glazer inside out. He said, you know, he got mentioned by Seferin directly. I think it takes a lot for a guy like that to go public on his mistrust of, a, of another colleague. Do you think this has damaged relationships within United and other clubs? I know we'll get to the fans in a minute, um, but in terms of other clubs you mentioned there, you know, the, like the likes of Seferin and, and, and with, with Woodward, I know Woodward's leaving, but how has this sort of played out with other clubs looking at Manchester United and, and especially, you know, the, the sort of the ones in, in, in UEFA? Well, in fact, UEFA, the Premier League across the board, really. Mm, yeah, I, I do think it would be you know, a, a very uh, difficult situation. I mean, listen, with Woodward resigning, I mean, that, that maybe in hindsight looks like the only thing he, ha- he could do really because if you're going back around, you know, the negotiation table trying to sign a player from a club that you've basically just tried to shaft, how 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 are those negotiations going to go? Um, I, I couldn't really get my head around that. And there is, there's some, there's a lot of Ill, Ill feeling amongst the rest of the Premier League clubs as to what retribution they want and, and they were really focused on the individual directors involved because, they were party to meetings that was including information that was confidential and how, you know, it was very sensitive really. And they're wondering, was this then, you know, was this used in terms of trying to launch the Super League? You know, it's a question for them to answer in, in time, but that is certainly the feeling that's coming across. Do you think there the, the will be any retribution? You mentioned there about individual directors and I don't think anyone's going to lose too much sleep if, if you know, Woodward or whoever you know, faces some sort of punishment. I know he's resigning, but in terms of the clubs, there's there's been so many ideas sort of suggested of points of fines of of whatever. Do you see anything like that happening, or do you think there's still an element that they want to sort of the need to work together and they need clubs on board when it comes to the Premier League and the UEFA? For sure, yeah. You know, United aren't going to go anywhere. They're not going to you know um, kick them out of the Premier League <laughs> at all or anything like that. It's just I think they want to have some kind of retribution to the individuals involved. And I think they'll, they will, you know, they've opened, uh, they've opened the genie a little bit here with Boris Johnson getting involved and talking about legislation and, and you know, Keir Starmer supporting it from the Labour side. So, um, you know, for that to not happen at all, I, I, there's going to be something that happens there. Maybe it's a regulator that actually doesn't have too many teeth, possibly. But I would be surprised if government had made this much of a song and dance about it and then don't do anything. So I wonder if that's the kind of, Thing that, that comes back to them um and yeah but i think in general you know i can't imagine you know that they're going to be making any sanctions against these big clubs because they ultimately do need them you know for the broadcast revenue internationally domestically that that is where the money is really and that that's why they've constantly pushed for more and more and more you know the international rights that were sold recently that they, they changed from a an even split for all 20 clubs to a, a sort of merit-based system in terms of where you finished in the league and how many games you were live on TV. So that is something that recently has happened that maybe they could have a look at. Would, would they reverse that, you know, to kind of have a more democratic uh, share of money? I, I don't know, but yeah, they're the kind of things I think that they might try and do. In terms of Woodward, um, he's obviously leaving at the end of the year, I think. How do you think, he, have you sort of given a brief, I know you can't go into it, a brief assessment of his time at Manchester United. How do you think he sort of, Almost how will he be remembered? Because for a lot of people, he's like the bogeyman. And yeah. then for others, I've seen this sort of narrative of, well, actually, you know, he's done some good. I don't think he's done any good, to be honest with you. But how do you think he'll be assessed? I think people will look at it. And it was always the Glazers guy, wasn't he? So, you know, you, you always got that 
you know, mark against you from a fan perspective in terms of a, an aggressive um, leverage takeover. Um, and then if you look at the football side of things, you know, you sort of mentioned that they've spent £1 billion um, on transfers. And that is something that they seem to be, you know, pushing this idea that, you know, the Glazers did spend. And, and they, they have spent money, but is that a positive that you've spent a £1 million and United haven't won the, the, the Premier League since Ferguson retired? It was obviously going to be a difficult situation, but, you know, he learned on the job. There was so much waste. Um, even now, you know, you hear about stories of things taking forever to get done at, at Manchester United internally. Um, and I just wonder wonder what comes next really you know it will it be sort of more of the same but he, he his role Edward Woods was to 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 serve the Glazers so that's where everything comes from and he's in that regard he's, he's done well you know in terms of growing the commercial revenues and that would you know along with Richard Arnold that has sort of incubated United from the worst of the difficulties during the pandemic so I suppose you sort of have that as the positive but from a football perspective you know, he's gone through managers. Okay, he's, he's kept faith with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, and, and maybe in hindsight, that looks like I, I, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, and I think that looks like a good move. Um, but I don't know if it's by design. You know, it was a caretaker role that then sort of escalated. So, um, yeah, I, I guess nobody will be saying that Edward Wood did a amazing job for Manchester United. I think they'll just sort of say, let's move on. You mentioned it there about, you know, his replacement. Could it be more of the same? Lots of uh, United fans would love to see someone like Edwin van der Sar's a name that keeps getting bandied about as coming as a as a chief executive or executive vice chairman, I think Edward would call himself or whatever you want to call it. You know the, the role I'm on about. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that happening? Do you see a footballer or a Manchester United person coming in or do you think it is going to be another banker or another sort of businessman, if you will? My gut would be that it's going to be someone that knows business, you know, football business. Um, you know, Richard Arnold could shuffle across um, and, you know, uh, kind of keep things level in, in that regard, you know, keep things going in that regard. Um, he obviously knows the Glazers. Um, so that would kind of be their instinct for protecting what they've already got. Um, you've got John Merton now on the football side. Was was that a move that was kind of done with a potential for, for this to, to happen? Um I think the Edwin van der Sar thing is really appealing. Um, he obviously understands how, how it is to, to run a football club, whether that's what United would go for and what they need. I don't know. I'm, I'm still to be convinced on that. It could be another football administrator outside of Manchester United that, that comes in. There's a few guys in the Premier League that I think are, are good, solid executives. Whether they thought, actually, let's go that route, that, I think that's a possibility. Um, yeah, I th the Edwin van der Sar thing is, is intriguing for sure. I, I've obviously had conversations in the past you know, about you know, the director of football role, I guess, whether or not Edwin van der Sar looked at that and thought that's actually not enough authority for what I would like. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but yeah, I suppose wait and see, you know, it's happened suddenly. I don't think this was something that they had a, a big, you know, plan, planning session about and who's going to succeed. Um, so I think things are still to be decided. In terms of the fans, I mean, obviously there's been, you know, no love lost between the fans and the Glazers ever since they took over. But now it seems like there's a real momentum gathering of, of fan sort of anger towards the owners of feeling that that something can be done that we've seen protests um there's been people down at carrington there's been other protests planned i mean what do you think this this whole episode has done for the relationship between the glazers fans do you think this could lead somewhere along the line to the glazers selling up and moving on uh, that is this sort of initial um theory isn't it i mean I, I think the only thing that would happen there is if they felt that they could never get this european super league off the ground and therefore that kind of consistent um, revenue that they they basically want you know they, they want their business to be you know predictable no chance of not qualifying for the Champions League where we've seen this season how much of an impact that has had on the finances it's, it's kept them in in um, making profit this this latest quarter the Champions League that's the only thing that did if they're in the Europa League they would have made a loss so they want that guarantee of income uh, if they feel like they can't get that I mean it, and it looks like the, how would you get that now you know in the next five six years this plan has to surely be you know put to bed for for a good while yet. I'm sure they'll try and come back with it. Um, but so I wonder if that is, is something that they would look at and go, well, actually, it's not worth our while, you know, to keep pushing in this regard. Maybe that maybe time is now to, to cash out. Um, but then on the flip side, you know, th th you know, we thought this before about the Glazers, you know, who, who would actually buy off them for a start? And as long as they can keep taking dividends and um, selling shares without losing control, as Avram Glazer has done recently, why would you necessarily sell something? You know, you've, you've got it. You can keep, you know, making money from it. That is that is the essence of why they own United. So I wouldn't be too excited about them selling up just yet.
You touched there on one thing there. You said about the, the Super League could be, you know, it could not be put to bed. Like the, there could be a chance they try and do it again. Do you see them coming up with a new idea, something else like a Super League? Or do you think that that is it now for this idea of an elite club, if you will, or elite group, sorry, of, of clubs? Yeah, there's certainly, I mean, listen, there's been talk of a Super League for years, hasn't there, even back to the 60s. It's not like it's a, a new concept. Um, I think, I suppose, the American way of thinking about things with their NFL hats and the NBA hats, you know, that is obviously accelerated this, you know, made it more real, I suppose, than it has been in the past. Um, but there's obviously been a lot of work done behind the scenes in terms of trying to get finance for it. I'm sure they will have had talks with broadcasters over it, although no broadcasters putting their hands up and saying, yeah, it was us uh, that were ready to, to show it on our screens. Um, so there, there will be people always thinking about this and having an appetite for it. Um, but I just think the way, the, the amount of um, animosity towards it from the fans, from government, from other clubs, from other organisations has, you know, it's really got to cause some lasting bruising. And, you know, how how long do you leave it before you try again? I don't know. I think, I think it'll be a while yet. Laurie, it's been great chatting to you. Everyone watching, make sure you go and check out Laurie's work on The Athletic, always on the, the cutting edge of things there when it comes to Manchester United. Much appreciated and we'll chat to you again soon. Pleasure, Jay. Cheers, pal. So that was Laurie Whitwell for The Athletic. Thanks a lot for chatting to us. Make sure you go and check out his work. This has been Stretford Paddock one-on-one -on -one interview. We're going to have loads more of these coming up. We're going to keep you posted as to what is going on with the Glazers, with this Super League nonsense, which now seems to be dead in the water, if they are going to try something like that again. And make sure you are getting involved in the comments, liking, subscribing and sharing. I've been Jay Marty. Thanks for watching.